Okay, uh, good day, good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone, and I'm very happy to be here with you uh, for this third uh, working group meeting of our Cost Action European Burden of Disease Network. Uh, my name is Brecht de Vleeschouwer. I work as an epidemiologist at CNSANO, the Belgian Institute for Health, and I'm also the chair of this Cost Action, uh, and I'm very happy and proud to be able to host you uh, during today's uh, working group meeting. Um, today and tomorrow, because uh, we have split our working group meetings over two days. Uh, today, we will focus on the activities, the uh, outputs of our cost action. We will give you a, a detailed overview of why we exist, who we are, uh, but most importantly, how our action can support your needs and your interests. Uh, tomorrow, we will give the floor to our members. We will have uh, a number of abstracts that will be presented uh, covering a wide variety of topics related to burden of disease. And we will conclude uh, tomorrow's session with um, a poster presentation session, again, uh, from a variety of members within our network. But today, we will focus on who we are, what we do, and how we can support you. Um, I will start by giving a general introduction to, uh, to our cost action, and then I'll start zooming in on some of the elements uh, of, our, of our network. Um, I will talk about the networking mechanisms that we can support, uh, such as the, the meetings that we are organizing. Um, I'll also talk about capacity building, um, such as the uh, capacity building that happens through our training schools. Uh, later on, our colleague Tina will talk more about individual uh, mobility as a capacity building mechanism. She will talk about the mobility and dissemination grants. Then we will have a short break, uh, followed by two presentations from two of our working group leaders focusing on specific activities and, and outputs of our network, uh, dealing with knowledge translation and the burden of COVID-19. Um, at the end of today's session, we will talk about um, our um, activities and, uh, and outputs in terms of scientific research. Um, I will be joined by my colleagues, Juanita Haaksma and Elena von der Lippe. And then I will conclude with a summary of how you can support the network and how the network can support you and about the next steps for uh, this meeting. Um, but Let's start with the beginning and the beginning the, the very basic rationale for our network is that policymakers, researchers, people interested in, uh, in public health often ask themselves very basic questions. They, they want to know what the most relevant diseases um, are in their country, which risk factors are contributing the most to, uh, to these diseases, because it's the risk factors, of course, that we can act upon. They also want to know how the impact is evolving over time and how this impact compares uh, between countries or within uh, their own country across subnational entities. So a large number of very basic, very fundamental questions. But if you think about these questions, then the answer might not be that evident. And one main reason is that you can answer these questions using a variety of, of indicators. You could look, you look at mortality of diseases or prevalence of diseases or other indicators, and all of these will probably give you a different answer. Um, so the solution to this problem is to use summary measures of population health, such as the DALI or disability adjusted life here. And this is indeed what the focus is of our cost action. Um, the DALI indicator relies on the philosophy that we all want to have a long life in good health. So we all want to be born in perfect quality of life and continue living in perfect quality of life until our ideal life expectancy. But of course, the reality is, is often different than this. Maybe we have broken our leg at the age of 20 and lost quality of life, but then we recovered, we kept living in somewhat lower quality of life. Maybe at a later age, we will develop a chronic disease, continue living in lower quality of life, and then die before 
our ideal life expectancy. So this means that there is a difference, there is a gap between the ideal scenario and this uh, observed scenario. And it is this gap that the DALI metric is quantifying. So it's quantifying how much time lived in good health is lost because of living with a disease and dying due to disease. And this gap is then broken down in two components. The first component, the years lived with disability, quantify the health losses due to living with a disease, living with reduced quality of life. And the second part is the years of life lost, which uh, reflects the healthy life years lost due to dying prematurely. So this is the general concept of the DALI metric, a concept that was established in the 90s. So it's relatively recent. Um, but as we all know, um, the, the reason why this has become uh, so popular and so integrated over time is because of the, the global burden of disease study. The DALI metric was also developed in the context of the early global burden of disease studies. And then these studies kept uh, generating updates of the estimates using more and more sophisticated uh, statistical infrastructures to perform the calculations uh, where nowadays they are able to provide updates on an annual basis uh, for more than 300 diseases in all countries of the world by age, sex and year. So a very sophisticated um, piece of information um, which has greatly drawn attention to the concept of burden of disease worldwide. Um, if we zoom in on the uh, activities related to burden of disease happening in, uh, in European countries, and here I'm showing a, a map uh, developed uh, in the context of the systematic review of burden studies conducted in the WHO European region, well, then we see that there's actually quite some uh, heterogeneity in the extent to which burden of disease has been applied in different countries. We see that there are a number of countries where a large number of studies have been conducted, but also several countries where zero or very few studies have been conducted. And also the studies that have been conducted varied quite a lot in scope and, uh, and coverage. So we know that the concept of burden of disease and DALIs is very important, very popular, but at the same time, we see that there is big heterogeneity in the application and, and probably also the capacity to apply this methodology to interpret and use available estimates in our European countries. Um, we also see that in addition to IHME and the global burden of disease study, there are other international organizations that generate uh, burden of disease estimates at global, but also at country level. Um, and it is not always evident for people like us to understand how these estimates compare, how they can be interpreted in the local context. Um, and one of the reasons is that there's not always a good interaction or, or platform that allows us to, uh, to interact with these agencies. So these estimates are being generated, but at country level, it's not always easy to understand, interpret, and uh, use these estimates. So in summary, the, uh, the problem statement that we want to address with our action is uh, starting from the observation that burden of disease and police play a very important role nowadays in uh, public health monitoring and decision-making. Uh, but unfortunately, that there's still uh, heterogeneity in the technical capacity at country level to, uh, to apply um, and valorize these estimates. There's not always good interaction or even harmonization between different efforts. Um, before our network was launched, there wasn't a single technical platform to support methodological advances. Um, and another important element that many of us are struggling with is that we have limited understanding of how knowledge translation and uh, policy transfer can be integrated in the burden of disease framework. So, of course, we want our estimates to be used to have an impact on public health decision making. But this mechanism of knowledge translation and policy transfer is something that we don't always have 
uh, a lot of experience and expertise with. So these are the challenges and our network is then established with a name to address these challenges. So in a nutshell, we try to serve as a technical platform for integrating and strengthening capacity in burden of disease assessment across Europe, but also beyond. And we are not limited to the European continent. We also have an international vision. Uh, zooming in more in detail on our objectives, we can see that we have a number of research coordination objectives and uh, capacity building objectives. In terms of research coordination, we want to bring together the experts working on burden of disease, the available expertise, so that we can transform the scattered landscape into a more integrated and transnational team. We want to understand the differences between methods by comparing uh, different studies and approaches, which could in turn lead to uh, harmonization of, uh, of methods and estimates. Uh, we also want to have a better understanding of the current knowledge and data gaps and address these by setting up international uh, studies. And we want to serve as an advocacy group for the burden of disease approach. So we want to um, put this concept on the tables, on the agendas, uh, so that more people will have an understanding of the benefits and added value um, and the technicalities of this approach. In terms of capacity building, we want to uh, build up and increase capacity in burden of disease assessment across Europe and beyond. Uh, we want to be this technical platform where knowledge and expertise can be shared and exchanged. And we want to be very proactive in integrating knowledge translation in the burden of disease framework. Um, so this is who we are. I have talked a lot about what we want to achieve, but now I want to zoom in a bit more on, uh, on who we are. Um, so far, this is the, the only group photo that we have been able to make uh, in, a, uh, in a face to face context. Uh, we had our first working group meeting uh, early 2020 in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and this was the first time where many of us could meet uh, in person. Um, but this is who we are. We are a network of currently over 300 members from a large number of countries, all working together to uh, strive towards an integration and strengthening of capacity and burden of disease assessment across Europe and worldwide. Um, the last time that I counted, we had uh, 308 members who signed up for our network. And these members are affiliated to 38 um, European countries. Um, our network is a cost action and cost is an organization uh, which receives funding from Horizon Europe. Uh, cost stands for cooperation in science and technology, and they support a very large number of networks dealing with any scientific topic. Um, according to the policies of the cost association, um, countries are classified in, in different ways. Um, they identify a number of full and cooperating member countries, and these are the 39 countries that are listed here. So in addition to the countries that are represented, also the Czech Republic is uh, one of those full members. But unfortunately, today we are still missing representatives from the Czech Republic. So if any of you would have any colleagues, uh, friends uh, working in the Czech Republic, don't hesitate to invite them and become a member of the network so that we can have a complete um, picture of these uh, full members in, in Europe. Uh, we also have uh, the World Health Organization and the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies as uh, so-called specific organizations um, being part of our network. Um, but I have mentioned before that we have an international vision as well. Um, and here I'm very happy to, to let you know that over the past months and years, we have gradually been able to expand our network. 
Uh, and today we have representatives from um, quite a number of uh, non-European uh, or non-full member uh, countries. Uh, we have uh, five so-called near neighbor countries in our network. And these are countries that are bordering the European region. So we have representatives from Belarus, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, and Tunisia. And then we also have a growing number of so-called international partner countries. These are all the other countries in the world. So we have Canada, US, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Mongolia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, and the UAE as our international partner countries in, uh, in the network. And we are very active in trying to expand this uh, network membership. So again, if you would have any contacts, any people who would be interested in what we do, uh, don't hesitate to encourage them to, uh, to become a member of the network. Um, the way that we work is uh, described in, in this slide. So we are organized into five different working groups. Later on, we will talk much more about actual activities of these working groups. Um, but we have structured the, the network into three vertical and two horizontal uh, working groups. The vertical working groups focus on specific, um, specific activities, specific um, applications of burden of disease, NCTs, infectious diseases, and risk factors, while the two horizontal um, working groups focus on transversal activities such as methods and knowledge transfer. Um, each of the working groups has a working group leader and co-leader, and we are further supported by a grant awarding coordinator and a science communication manager. And these are the people behind the network, the people that um, form the, the core group um, of the network. Uh, in addition to myself as chair, um, Milena is supporting us as action vice chair. Uh, Tina is our grant awarding coordinator. She will also present later today. And Grant is our science communication manager, um, who's amongst others dealing with our Twitter account. And these are the different working group leaders. Some of them uh, will also be presenting today. Juanita and Marek uh, deal with the NCDs and injuries, Sarah and Ricardo with infectious diseases, Dietrich and Jaime with risk factors, Elena and Ian with methods, and Hank and uh, our other Elena with knowledge transfer. Um, okay. Uh, the last um, formal or administrative slide, but to give everyone a good overview of how our network is structured. Um, each of you, everyone who is a member, including myself, uh, we are all working group members. So this is the, the label that we all um, have. And we have asked everyone to sign up for at least one of the, the vertical pillars and one of the horizontal pillars. Uh, so we are all working group members, irrespective of where we work or where we live. Um, but a number of these working group members will form the management committee. And this is composed of um, a maximum of two members per full or cooperating cost country member and maximum one observer from the specific organizations. And the role of the management committee is to support the administrative follow up of the network, uh, amongst others, dealing with the, uh, the budgetary issues. Then finally, we have our core group, uh, which is uh, composed of the chair, co-chair, working group leaders, co-leaders, and the two transversal coordinators. Um, and their role is to uh, guarantee the day-to-day -day follow up of the network. Uh, we meet once a month, more or less, to keep track of where we are and what we need to do to keep the network uh, going. Um, one novelty, especially for the people who are uh, who were already part of the network uh, from the beginning, um, a novelty is that the, the cost association has made some changes to their um, administrative management uh, mechanisms. And one of the big changes is that they developed a new tool 
uh, to manage uh, working group membership. So today, um, it is on the one hand easier to become a working group member because everyone, irrespective of where they work, they just need to fill in um, a form with three basic questions and then they uh, will be able to join as a working group member. Um, it is also allowing the cost association to keep a better track of our uh, network membership. Um, the officially registered members will be listed on the cost website. So you can have a look if you are listed or not. Um, and cost will also use this information to estimate the size of the network, which is then in turn used to determine the budget for our future grant periods. Um, so, uh, yeah, a warm question to uh, or request to the members that were there from the beginning. Um, you probably aren't yet officially registered as a working group member, uh, but please uh, make sure to do this via this link or the apply button on our homepage of the website. Uh, please do this as, as soon as possible because it will guarantee the, the sustainability and the financial robustness of our uh, network. So this is a kind request to everyone to make sure that you are formally registered as a working group member. Okay. Right. Um, so I've talked a lot about um, what we want to achieve, which challenges we want to address. I've also talked about who we are and how our network has grown. Uh, but the biggest part of this meeting will be on our activities. So we will be presenting what we have done already. Um, and we will also present how you can contribute to the next steps in, a, in our cost action. Um, and before we start that, um, we would like to hear from you. So we would like to hear, first of all, why you wanted to uh, register or become a net network member. Um, we then also want to ask how your experience has been with our, uh, our network so far. Um, and what we can do better to, uh, to better accommodate your needs. Uh, so you are all kindly requested to go to uh, this uh, link. I will also put it in the chat. And there um, you will see the, the questions um, to yeah, ask about your experiences with, uh, with our network. And the first question is um, about your expectations from our cost action. So you can just type in one or a, or a few words um, to express yeah, what your expectations are, what you would need uh, from, uh, from the network. And I see that the results are coming in. I'm sharing uh, the results now. You should be able to see that. And uh, the word cloud is still updating, which is very nice. Uh, but then, of course, we, we already see some uh, important topics popping up. Um, what is important for you is the, the networking, the collaboration aspect. Uh, so the possibility to, uh, to interact, to exchange, to meet new people, new colleagues, new friends, um, to, uh, to become a network, to be connected. Um, I also see that there are some questions related to, um, or suggestions related to methodological advice, support, technical support, uh, strengthening education, methodology, knowledge communication. Um, 
Okay. Uh, some people are also referring to, to research, to articles. So the, uh, the possible outputs of, um, of these collaborative activities and, uh, and capacity building uh, exchanges. And I think this summarizes very well what we want to achieve and what we have been trying to achieve um, over the past few, uh, few months and years. Um, our next question, and uh, thanks a lot everyone for uh, contributing. So our next, next question is, uh, and this is mainly relevant for the people that uh, were already part of the network uh, some, uh, some more time ago, uh, is how satisf satisfied you have been with, uh, with our activities to date. And you can answer this on a scale from zero to 10, where 10 out of 10 is, uh, is excellent. And one out of 10 is uh, not so excellent, of course. Uh, so this is to, to have a general idea of, of your feeling about the, uh, the network. And the next question will then allow you to provide some specific suggestions on what we can do better. Okay, so I see that the average score is uh, is more or less stabilized. So eight point three out of ten, which is a, a very good score. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. And we know that we don't deserve a ten out of ten, of course. And we also see that there are many things that can be improved. Uh, but we do uh, appreciate that you are uh, quite satisfied with uh, yeah what we have done. Uh, to date. Um, but of course, what is important is to learn about how we can do better and how we can improve. So this final question asks you to provide some, some ideas, some suggestions on what we can do to, uh, uh, to improve, to make uh, sure that our cost action is even better able to address uh, your needs. And I'll be hiding the results for a while so that you're not too uh, influenced by uh, by the others. Okay, so let's start and, and have a look. Okay, so what, what I see here is, is an important call for uh, more meetings, more interaction, more possibilities to, to co collaborate, uh, more joint activities and, uh, and applications. So basically doing a, a better job at making use of the network of the, the 300 people in the network to work together um, to exchange and uh, um, and developed new uh, new activities, and I think this is a a message that we uh, we welcome very much. Um, also, see some uh, specific suggestions related to the need for more technical uh, support, um, better transfer of knowledge, um, uh, referring to our newsletter as well. 
uh, someone is also asking us to continue with what we do. So that's of course also very, uh, very welcome. Um, active mentoring, indeed, uh, more training opportunities. Yeah. Okay. No, but this is uh, very much appreciated and also very much with what we uh, already had in mind in terms of how we can do, do better um, in the coming uh, months and years. So thank you all uh, very much for this, uh, this feedback. Um, I will go back to the presentation. Okay, I guess if all went well, you should see the, the presentation now. Eh? Um, so we have heard your, uh, your suggestions and uh, today we already want to launch one new, uh, new mechanism or new activity. Uh, to support you in uh, in these uh, in the, with these suggestions, uh, so today and also in our past meetings, we have heard the call for more um, for being more proactive in developing opportunities to collaborate and interact, um, and uh, we want to address this need by um, asking you as uh, as network members to set up a number of task forces. And a task force is a small group, a, a subgroup or a working group, if you wish, um, that is interested in tackling a specific topic. Uh, today, we already have a working group or sorry, a task force, which is very active. And this is the, the group led by Sarah Pires on COVID-19 disease burden. She will be presenting about the activities of the COVID burden task force later on. Uh, but the idea of the task force is to bring people together who either have already some expertise in the topic or other people who have a very um, urgent or real life uh, need for exchange. So, for instance, people that today want to start on the COVID-19 disease burden, and they can then become a member of this task force. And, um, member of the task force and yeah, uh, join the, the activities, the meetings, uh, etc. Uh, so what we want to ask you today and, and also later on, and today is not the end point, is to define some, some additional uh, task forces. Um, I've already added the suggestion to add a task force on the burden related to PFAS, which is a very important topic in, in Belgium and uh, and probably other countries as well. And for each task force, we want to have one or a number of coordinators and of course, members who want to join and actively contribute. Uh, so if all went well, technically, you should be able to go to the link that I'm also typing in the chat now. And this link will bring you to a Google spreadsheet where you should all have access and where you should be able to add your name or add a new column for a new task force that you want to start coordinating or that you want to propose uh, to the network. So we hope that this can be a good way to set up new activities and really take advantage of the, the network and the expertise and the interest that we have within our network. Okay, so um, the Spreadsheet will remain available throughout the meeting and also after the meeting. So please feel free whenever you have time or, or ideas to, uh, to look at the spreadsheet and uh, fill in your name. Okay. Um, right. Um, to, to continue with uh, the story about um, what we do and how we can support you, um, it's important to know that the that cost networks, cost actions uh, don't provide funding for, um, for personnel or staff, et cetera, but they provide funding for a number of uh, networking tools. Uh, so with the funding that we have, we can organize a number of meetings, uh, administrative meetings, but also working group meetings, um, such as the one today, although this doesn't cost anything. We are also able to set up uh, work shops or task force meetings or conferences 
Uh, so setting up meetings that allow people to get together and, uh, and exchange. We can also support dissemination activities, for instance, going to conferences or paying for the open access fee of publications related and resulting from the cost action. And then we have a number of capacity building mechanisms that we can support, including the organization of training schools and also the support for individual mobility, ranging from uh, conference grants for individuals affiliated to inclusiveness target countries or near neighbor countries, um, individual exchanges either face to face uh, via the short term scientific missions and online via the new virtual mobility grants. And throughout today's sessions, we will uh, give you more details and examples of each of these tools and continue encouraging, encouraging you to make best use of these tools. Um, in the implementation of these uh, tools, uh, we always need to keep an eye on, uh, on excellence and inclusiveness um, to support the cost policies. So this means that we need to guarantee geographical coverage, um, make sure that countries that are uh, less um, research um, developed can also benefit from, uh, from the network. And this is linked to the definition of inclusiveness target countries, which are the, the Eastern European countries and Portugal. Um, so we need to be very proactive in, uh, in bringing these countries on board and giving them uh, extra opportunities. Um, we also need to keep an eye on age and gender balance. And today, uh, COST is using the concept of young researchers and innovators to identify any researcher or innovator younger than 40. Uh, so young people and good gender balance is uh, are important um, considerations that we need to uh, keep in mind when setting up our activities. Okay. Um, to, um, show these um, different tools in a different way uh, with the different tools, the different activities that we can support. We can um, set up networking activities, capacity building activities and joint research activities. And as shown in the diagram, all of these activities, of course, are interlinked and support each other. Sometimes it's uh, not always easy to see how they are different uh, from each other. So there's overlap between networking and capacity building, of course. Um, but we have set up a, a wide number of, uh, of activities, and this is what we want to show you today, uh, starting with our networking activities. Um, and networking, of course, means uh, trying to meet each other, ideally face to face. Uh, and here we see a photo of uh, the first time that we met in October 2019 in Brussels when we launched our cost action. Uh, we then also met in Marseille for the European Public Health Conference. And the first time that we met in a, in a very big group, more than 100 participants, was in uh, Copenhagen early 2020. But then, as we all know, uh, something happened which made that we are not able to meet in person anymore. Uh, we did try to assume our meeting activities in an online way. Uh, as we are doing today. And of course, we realize that this is uh, much less efficient and, and fun than meeting in person, but it's probably the best we can do to keep uh, our network going. Um, we hope that in the, the near future, it will be possible once again to meet in person. And in that respect, I'm very happy to announce you that we have the, the crazy idea to have um, a conference uh, in uh, 2022, um, and this conference uh, would be labeled the, the International Burden of Disease Conference. And if all goes well, this can take place in uh, June of this year in Belgrade, Serbia, uh, very kindly hosted by Milena and her colleagues. So please keep an eye on our website and newsletters because more information uh, will become available soon. 
Okay. Um, meetings, in addition to the meetings that we organize, we are also active at the, the European Public Health Conference and the World Conference on Public Health, uh, where we always submit the number of workshop abstracts to make sure that burden of disease is put uh, higher on the agenda. Uh, we were very successful in the past few editions of this conference. Um, last year, we had uh, five different workshops uh, linked to the activities that we do, uh, linked to knowledge translation, the work on, on COVID disease burden, etc. Um, and all of the presentations and recordings of these um, and these workshops are available via our website. So don't hesitate to browse through our website and have a look at uh, what we have presented in the past. Um, we also developed some new possibilities to connect in a digital way. And one of these possibilities is the, the spotlight section on our web, sorry, website, where the idea is that uh, researchers, individuals from within our network can write a short blog post about the new publication or a project that they have been uh, working on so that they can uh, put their work in the spotlight. Uh, if you would be interested to have your work highlighted here, don't hesitate, of course, to, to contact us. And another new mechanism that we set up uh, during the COVID uh, crisis is our webinar series. Uh, again, a digital way to connect, uh, but also allowing us to connect easily with our international partners uh, because the digital world, of course, doesn't have any, uh, any boundaries. Um, you can have a look at our past webinars via our website. Um, and again, I'm very happy to be able to announce the, the next webinar. And this will uh, take place in March uh, of this year and will uh, be dedicated to the uh, new estimates of global burden of occupational disease developed by the World Health Organization and the International Labour Organization. And again, more information about this will be come available uh, soon. Okay. Um, our website is kept up to date with our latest news and activities. Um, we are also active on Twitter and LinkedIn. So um, please yeah, follow us on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. Also keep an eye on your mailbox because you should receive our newsletters on a regular basis. And this is, of course, also important for you to remain aware of what is happening within our network and which opportunities are created to uh, support you. Okay. Right. So, um, after having talked about the, the networking activities, um, we will uh, zoom in on capacity building. And with our cost action, we are able to uh, set up capacity building activities in group, so the training schools, uh, but also individual capacity building activities, the individual mobility uh, mechanisms. Um, I'll start with the training schools and then Tina will uh, talk about the individual mobility um, options. Uh, training schools are regular courses of at least three days. Um, and so far we have organized two uh, training schools dealing with the general concepts of burden of disease. Uh, as you see on the screenshot each time in an online way, but um, it, I believe it's worked quite, uh, it worked out quite well. Um, I don't want to say myself too much about, um, uh, about these training schools. Instead, I would like to give the, the floor to uh, some of the participants of these training schools um, to tell you what they um, have experienced and, and learned uh, through these training schools. So to do that, I will share with you uh, the testimonials. So. And I'll also be sharing the audio. If you don't hear anything, please share. 
because then something went wrong. But here we go. Hi, uh, my name is Kiva Kohli. I'm an epidemiologist at the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin. Um, I took part in the Burden EU General Concepts training course in September last year. Um, the training was really helpful for me as a burden of disease is a new topic for me. Um, and I'm currently working on a project um, to calculate the burden of COVID-19 um, in a number of different countries. So I very much appreciated the training and um, perhaps we'll get to do another someday soon. Bye bye. Hello, I'm Bridget Duramin from the National Institute of Health um, in Rome, in Italy. I participated to the training school uh, on burden of disease uh, last year. It was a great, great pleasure to study from uh, experts from uh, all European countries. They also provided uh, useful materials, exercises that will be useful for further references. Uh, I'm really glad to the course action that uh, supported um, this school. And uh, thank you all. The general concepts training school was very important because it allowed me to clarify several doubts that I experienced when dealing with the burden of disease uh, studies. And uh, it is also important to, to provide the members of the network with a common ground of knowledge about these concepts. So now I'm looking forward for the, um, the next uh, advanced trainings and hopefully in an uh, in-person mode. Hello friends and colleagues, my name is Federica Gazzelloni. I am one of the GBD collaborators in the Global Burden of Diseases. I thank Cost Action for giving me the opportunity um, to collaborate as a reviewer and a co-author in different studies, as well as giving me um, interesting insights um, from, with the general concept training school, which I followed a few months ago. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jay Henry. I am glad uh, to have had the opportunity to attend the second edition of the General Concept of Burden of Disease Training School organized last year in September. Uh, during this uh, very interesting event, uh, we had the opportunity uh, to get more insight into the rationale and methodology behind uh, quantifying the burden of, this, of different conditions. Uh, this was really interesting and I look forward to more exciting opportunities in the future. Thank you. I've been intrigued by how years of life lost and years lived with disability are calculated for multiple diseases and injuries. I sign up to the Burden EU training school and I learn how to perform such calculations. It was also a great opportunity for me to build my network. Thank you for everything. Good afternoon, my name is Silvia Reed and I work as a senior lecturer in psychology at the St. Mary's uh, University in London. I had the opportunity to do the training school, general concept of burden of disease, and it was uh, it has been a very excellent opportunity to um, introduce myself into the field. I had the opportunity to meet uh, different health professionals and researchers from different fields, and I had the opportunity to um, understand and to, to know which are the main uh, instruments and measures that uh, public health use to measure population health, including matrix, for example, the use of dailies and other type of uh, uh, metrics and measures that, uh, that have been used. Uh, I hope this uh, school will be also an opportunity to start new collaboration with other researchers and uh, I had uh, professional and I thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, there's more uh, testimonials, so you can have a look at the, the link and, and continue the uh, continue the presentation. But I think uh, the people um, who um, yeah who supported us in uh, in making this video were all very happy with uh, with their experience, and they are looking forward for uh, the next possibilities and opportunities that we will be able to uh, provide them with. Um, so. 
talking about future possibilities, um, then I need to go back to uh, presentation. So talking about future possibilities um, today, and this has also been announced to, to you by, uh, by our newsletter. Uh, today, we um, are welcoming uh, applicants for our new training school. So this will be the third training school that we will be organizing. Uh, and it will focus on uh, COVID-19 disease burden. It will take place uh, end of March, beginning of April in Slovenia, uh, kindly supported by uh, Tina and her colleagues, uh, and also conducted in collaboration with the FIRI project. Um, in this training school, we will talk about the general concepts of burden of disease, but with exercises applied to COVID-19. Uh, registrations are still open until the end of the month, so if you or any of your colleagues would be interested to join, please don't hesitate uh, to register. Um, we have foreseen some, some more training schools, of course, but uh, again, we would like to ask you about your suggestions and needs uh, for training schools. So please uh, reconnect to the, uh, to the WOOPLAB website. Um, where we will uh, open the new question. Uh, so the question is, uh, which training school should we develop next? So which topic should we cover in, uh, in our next uh, training schools? So I'll wait for a few more answers to start showing the results. Twenty. Okay. Okay. So let's have a look what I see here. Um, some. Quite a, a variety of uh, suggestions, which is nice. I see risk factors as one of the uh, the more frequent one. Uh, redistribution. I'm assuming this refers to redistribution of um, of ill-defined debts in the context of causes of death and years of life lost. I uh, also see knowledge translation popping up as a as an important one. Uh, forecasting, data quality assessment, foodborne diseases more advanced methods. Um, mm -mm. Okay, specific topics such as neurological diseases or COVID-19, uh, air pollution as a specific risk factor. Um, and as more entries come in, I see risk factor becoming bigger and bigger. Knowledge translation still one of the big ones. Um, in in that context, I'm very happy to already let you know that um, our colleagues uh, Elena and Hank are uh, working on on a knowledge translation training school, and this is planned to take place uh, in the the first half of this year, probably in May. So the uh, information about that will be uh, announced quite uh, quite soon. Uh, we will also be organizing another general concepts of burden of disease training school. Um, this will be hosted uh, in uh, in Georgia um, and will cover uh, live translation into a Russian language so that um, candidates and, and people from Russian uh, language speaking countries can uh, can also participate to this. Um, but it's very nice to see that risk factors is, is one of the big ones here, um, because indeed this is uh, on our uh, to do list for uh, for future years. Um, we had actually foreseen a, a specific question on this. So suppose that indeed we uh, will develop a risk factors training school, which specific risk factors would you then like to see addressed as examples or case studies in, uh, in this training school? 
uh, and this information will help us uh, develop this training school, which should probably take place in our next grant period, um, which will be uh, mainly the year 2023. Okay, let's have a look. Air pollution is already a big one. Uh, environmental, which covers air pollution. Um, but at the same time, a, a variety. Yeah? So it also, I also see behavioral risk factors, metabolic risk factors, uh, occupational risk factors. So it does seem that you have a very wide and, and broad interest. Uh, dietary risk factors as a, a specific behavioral one uh, also popping up as uh, being quite popular. Popular. Also see some less um, well studied risk factors such as uh, social connection. Um, so indeed, it would be uh, social factors. Also, uh, also interesting to uh, to start having a better look at uh, at these risk factors. Aging and immunosenescence also uh, quite interesting ones. In addition, of course, to yeah all the the common risk factors that are today included in uh, in the global burden of disease study for instance okay dietary risk factors have now uh, taken the lead uh, leaving air pollution behind on second place okay perfect social determinants indeed also uh, a very important one Right, but thanks a lot for your uh, feedback. I think this is very valuable information for us and will in uh, uh, setting up uh, our next training schools. So again, please make sure to keep an eye on your uh, mailbox for the newsletters and follow us via the website and our social media channels. Okay, uh, so now I've talked about the, the group trainings, the group capacity building. Um, I will now give the floor to Tina, who will uh, walk you through the different mechanisms for individual mobility. So I'll close my presentation and then Tina, I will um, invite you to start sharing your screen and take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, so my name is Tina Lesnik and I'm coming from, from the National Institute Public Health in Slovenia. And uh, being a grant awarding coordinator, I would like to present you individual mobility, which is uh, one of our networking activities, ANCOS, which are organized through a grant awarding process, which uh, basically means that um, every member who has a research idea and plan in BOD can apply for this uh, grant and be supported in this uh, in the research questions or work. Um, there are two um, groups of these grants and the first one refers to mobility of researchers and innovators and the second one our presentations at conferences organized by the third party. The third party here means that they are not organized in the cost action actions uh, conference. So they are organized by, some, by somebody else in cost action. And when, if we look more deeply into these uh, activities, uh, we have uh, so-called 
short-term scientific missions uh, and virtual mobility. And on the conference part, there are inclusiveness target countries conference, specific grants, and dissemination conference grants. I will uh, try to present to you how uh, the each of one. So, uh, short-term scientific missions or SDSM shortly are uh, visits of host organizations by researcher or innovator for the specific work for determined period of time. And uh, where the grant receives funding for implement, implementing the project, gains knowledge or access to a meet the treatment of techniques which are not available in whole institution. Uh, STSM post receives a new international partner in the institution and can develop long lasting collaboration. So this um, is um, meant to be in person, but the next uh, possibility is so called virtual mobility, which is new from the last two years. And it's, um, the, the aims are almost the same as SPSMs, but all the activities is taking place in virtual settings. So collaborations among researchers and innovations, uh, which helps to gain um, the knowledge and exchange learning techniques. Some examples of those activities, which can be taken under virtual mobility, are uh, virtual mentoring schemes where there is a uh, possibility of capacity building, different uh, possibility to harmonize, harmonize and standardize our networking, like setting up surveys, creating the discussion, preparing the questionnaires and response schemes, all among the action members. And oh, another example is to support the implementation of research coordination. So when we want to, for example, analyze data together or so on, we can also use this virtual mobility grant support. Um, the application in the ecosystem uh, will ask you for to fill in the ECOS uh, the title, start and end date. Uh, within the active grant period, the budget requested in information about the host institution and contact person for SDSM. Uh, and also, we would uh, they ask you for describe, describing the activity and the confirmation of the host and agreement for the, from the host institution. So, uh, uh, there should be also the, um, the contact made by the uh, to the post institution and arrange the the, the, the all the activities. So SDM, this is um, meant for SDSMs and also for virtual mobility. Um, other documents we would like to yeah ask you for SDSMs events to fill our free uh, application, which can be found on for the um, for SDSM grant, it goes up to 4,000 euros per grant, which can be covered for traveling, accommodations, and subsidiary expenses, implementation of the project, the delivery of the report, and overall effort. Um, virtual mobility grant can go up to 1,500 euros per grant. For overall effort, not necessarily covered by an employer or by a grant or the institution. The next possibility is IPC conference or dissemination conference, which is basically when you would like to present your own work, the conference. Uh, but for ICT conference, you should be a young researcher or an innovator coming from inclusiveness target country or near neighbor country. Uh, a, if you want to present the work of the action at the conference, then you can take a grant for, for, for dissemination conference. The definition for young researcher and innovator was already mentioned before. It should be 
under the age of 40. And here is the list of countries, uh, I, the, the countries of UNICE countries. So if you find your country listed here and you are young under 40s, you can apply for FC conference grant. Also, here is what is needed to fill in in the cost system when you apply for grant. Um, it should be conference title, date, uh, attendance type, budget. Uh, application form also have to state the relevance of the conference topic to the action, motivation and the potential impact on the applicant career, or in the case of uh, the uh, direction, uh, other activity, you should align the action science communication plan and expected impact to the cost action. This is meant for the dissemination form. And the budget for IPC and for dissemination conference grant is up to 2,000 euros for face-to-face -face conference or 500 euros for virtual conference and can convert uh, in the case of face-to-face -face conference for traveling, accommodation, subsidies, expenses, or for registration, the printing, or site poster and overall health. Uh, and here is another possibility I would like to mention. It is not in the individuality part of cost activities, but it's under dissemination and communication products, which offer eligible expenses for science publication, scientific publication in open access. So if you are to publish uh, a publication, a paper, and you'd like to um, have an open access, you can apply for, uh, for to cover the expenses for open access SSP uh, or proofreading, editing, translation, and layout expenses. Under the specific condition, it means that uh, this paper should be result of the work of the action and be authored by action participants from at least three different post members. Um, I would like to stress here that all the action should uh, have one, uh, one condition or uh, that they should acknowledge the main objectives of European Burden of Disease Network Cost Action, which would in practice mean that they are in the line of burden of disease methodology, uh, disease methodology like value calculation, that they are in the line with capacity building dissemination. Uh, these, these are the main uh, criteria they, um, they should support these activities. Um, brief statistic on which activities were already uh, taken on in the past action. There were one SDSM, uh, two uh, IPC conference grant, and six virtual mobility grants which were taken on in the last year. Uh, more information you can find on our uh, website here uh, under the uh, section activities, there are all of the activities well described. There are also the eligibility criteria, so it's all necessary thing to apply for. And you can always contact us to help you to develop your idea and your plan and how to support you with the grant section. Thank you, Greg. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot, uh, Tina. Um, if people would have any questions on this, uh, you can ask them now in the chat or later on uh, by email to, to Tina or myself. Um, we want to conclude this session with some uh, additional testimonials from people who um, took advantage of these um, uh, individual mobility grants. Um, you have probably seen that um, the 
the subtitles are generated in, in an automatic way, so it doesn't always match with what you should be hearing, but I'm hoping that it works uh, reasonably well. So these are the, the final testimonials from the uh, some of the individuals that took advantage of the uh, individual mobility grants. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Elena Palari, and I'm co-leading the Working Group 5 on Knowledge Translation for the European Burden of Disease Network. I was one of the recipients of the Virtual Mobility Grant on the implementation of a framework on BOD evidence use in practice. I'm very happy to say that this grant enabled me to come in contact with experts and interested members of the network in developing best practices from their country using data and knowledge translation of such data into developing uh, reporting guidelines and pathways towards knowledge translation of burden of disease use. To this end, this is a still work in progress, but the virtual mobility grant enabled to uh, collaborate and start virtual meetings with these uh, people across the different countries that would otherwise be not possible under these conditions. So I'm um, really looking forward to these grants being continued, and I hope that you also have the opportunity to be one of the recipients. I received a virtual mobility grant from the Burnley EU Network in the autumn of 2021. The grant was to support the communication and dissemination of activities related to the Scottish Burden of Disease Study and country-specific COVID-19 Burden of Disease Assessments. The opportunity was very helpful as it allowed for much wider communication of both our findings and methods to new audiences in a way that created synergies with our institutional communication strategy. The European Burden of Disease Network has really been a great experience. We've been working a lot together, we've been already publishing papers and I believe already learned a lot from each other. I really believe that there is still room to grow with much more to be done from European data to European knowledge translation. So thank you so much for everything. I have awarded a virtual mobility grant supported by the Burden EU Cost Action. During the virtual mobility activities, I have collaborated with more than 100 Burden EU participants and I learned about the methodological design choices that can be used to assess the burden of infectious diseases. Thank you for everything. Our cost action, the European Burden of Disease Network, has been incredibly important to support us um, in the last few months. Specifically under the Working Group on Infectious Diseases, a number of us got together to support each other to calculate the burden of COVID-19, which was challenging in a number of ways, a new disease and a new process for many of us. So we've been meeting regularly, developing tools and helping each other um, with, with success and a lot is yet to come. Hello, I'm Sarah from Malta, and I'm the recipient of both a short-term scientific mission at Sinciano Brussels, Belgium, as well as an ITC conference grant to present my work that originated from the STSM. Having the opportunity to take part in the STSM was a great experience since it was my first introduction to the DALIS metric. Having both a theoretical hands-on experience in calculating DALIS provided me a deeper understanding as well as the opportunity to undergo the first national bird of disease for my country. The action also provided me the financial means to present this work in an international conference and later on to publish in an open access journey. So thank you for this amazing opportunity. Okay, excellent. Um, so with this, we um, can conclude the first, uh, the first half of our um, working group session focused on on our activities, um, I suggest we can take some time now for um, a short uh, coffee or toilet break um, and reconvene in uh, seven minutes, uh, 2.25 Central European time uh, to continue with um, yeah, more insights on what we have done and how you can contribute. So please feel free to take some uh, some time off and then we will reconnect and uh, Hank will take the floor for welcoming you to the second half of um, of the session. Thank you. Het is goed hoor. Ja, dank u.
Uh, maar ik, ben, ik, ik kan alleen tot drie uur, dus uh, ben je dan weer terug? Uh, ja, ja, maar het is omdat ze zeggen dat ik nu meteen moet gaan, dus dat is dan de tand. Oh ja, goed. Nee, ik uh, pak hem straks gewoon op van je. Ja, dank je. Oké. Okay.
Welcome back, everybody. My name is Hank Hilrink. I'm one of the working group leaders. I'm, I'm taking over for Brecht for this moment to restart the meeting. I hope you're all back. I can't see too many videos. And uh, we're going to have uh, several other presentations. Uh, I'm going to present first about knowledge translation, and then Sarah Pires will uh, present about COVID-19. But let me first start my presentation. I can manage. It was good to see that uh, many of you actually uh, uh, indicated that knowledge translation is uh, of importance when thinking about burden of disease. And we have a working group five devoted to knowledge translation, uh, which is led by uh, Dr. Elena Pellari and myself. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about uh, what the activities are that we are doing, what kind of methodology do we apply, and what kind of next steps for the coming year we have in mind. But first, I would like you to have a similar voting first. It's about knowledge translation, so of course then you want to uh, involve people. Please uh, scan the QR code, or you can also go to menti.com and type the code 94616481. And I will try to share screen with uh, the results of the Mentimeter. Oh, so And the first one in my country, burden of disease studies are done. First, I would like to know how many of you are already familiar with burden of disease studies, Hank, especially in the countries. Yes. Can you copy the code on the chat? Oh, thank you. Uh, I can say it because I don't have access to the chat in the in the presentation mode. Nine four six one six four eight one. So let me repeat nine four six one six four eight one. Great, thank you. And we have about seventy plus participants, so but not everybody might be uh, logging in into the Mentimeter. But as you can see, and that this is very good news, of course that. Already many burden of disease studies are being done in most countries. There are four participants who don't have a burden of disease study in their country. And I'm going to wait a bit till we have 30 plus respondents. But the picture is clear. And it's also good. Oh, there's only one person that doesn't know. Okay, that's also good. And this network is also helping, of course, to get an overview of what kind of burden of disease studies are being done uh, in particular countries, but also across Europe and beyond. So we have 30 uh, respondents. I'm going to the next question. Uh, how are the results of the burden of disease studies used in your country? So not so much about if they are done, but how they are being used. And here the majority is indicating, see how many people responded, 30, more than half of you is just now and then, 30% not at all, so there's a lot to be done. And also, but that's rather positive as well, 20% is more, more or less indicating that it is being used in many documents and also policy documents. So we go to the next question. So then we're thinking about uh, knowledge translation, how to do that, and I will uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. But what do you think without having that uh, knowledge of 
of my presentation, what is the most difficult aspect of knowledge translation regarding burden of disease? Is it stakeholder engagement? Is it interacting with policymakers, access to sufficient resources or access to the right expertise? see almost 30 respondents and the picture is of course uh, the interaction with policymakers that's something that we are fa might be facing all uh, sometimes policymakers are different types of species but that's also what they think of uh, researchers so interaction is sometimes rather difficult stakeholder engagement access to suffi sufficient resources yeah that's something that is very difficult to help you with but access to the right expertise that is something, of course, where the burden, uh, the cost action uh, network is helping for to uh, that you can use it as a networking and also to find the right expertise within the network. I think the burden network is uh, an excellent opportunity for that. And stakeholder engagement, of course, is also very important and it's also part of the knowledge translation. Then the last one. Uh, focusing on the gap between policymakers and, and the researchers, how could we make that gap smaller between policymakers and burden of disease re, and burden of disease research, so that we have more detailed data and results, or more efforts from policymakers, more efforts efforts from researchers, or more attention to policy interventions to make it, of course, more policy relevant. Okay, so the actually the the what we the challenge for us as researchers is more that we are putting more efforts to reach out to the policymakers, but also by making it more policy relevant. For example, by uh, put, uh, giving more attention to policy interventions, and that of course links as well to what Brecht was saying before the importance of risk factors, because risk factors in general are the uh, can be seen as an entry point for policymakers. There are also people who want more detailed data and results. Um, let's see if that's going to work, but also 20% uh, thinks that policymakers should put more efforts. And I think it's an interaction between policymakers and researchers, and both should be trying to make the gap smaller. They might both benefit from it. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going now back to the presentation to tell you a little bit more about how we deal with knowledge translation in our working group. So what kind of methodology? And the idea is that we are developing a knowledge translation roadmap. But how to do that? That's the main question. And of course, then we have to go back to what is knowledge translation all about? And in general, we uh, use the WHO definition for this as the synthesis exchange and the application of knowledge by relevant stakeholders to accelerate the benefits of global and local innovation in strengthening health systems and improving people's health. Quite a lot of things that are being mentioned here, but it's rather important. The stakeholders, here, of course, are important. The exchange and the application of knowledge is important, but at the end, we want to improve health. So it's not only about knowledge, it's also by stimulating action as well. So that is might also be of importance. And if we look at what kind of models do we know for knowledge translation, then uh, roughly speaking, you can uh, distinguish four different models. Uh, model A is the push effort where the research producers more or less trying to push the, the results uh, to the users. It can be the pull model on the upper right where you have actually that the users are the more or less determining what the researchers are producing. Then you have a much more interactive 
exchange effort on the lower left. And of course, very that's a, a very ideal situation if you have a much more integrated approach where you have knowledge translation platforms where both users and producers are uh, can exchange their, their ideas, their wishes. However, what we see in Burden of the Seas, there's a very strong focus on model A, the push efforts, the push model, so that we are producing something and then we are trying to have, for example, policymakers to make use of the results. And if we think of burden of disease, it is not so easy, actually. Uh, it, the concept as such is not too easy to understand. The interpretation of the outcome is not always easy, no, not only for policymakers, also for researchers. There, uh, there are a lot of choices that have to be made. Uh, the, the, the calculation of the disability adjusted life years is very complicated. I included here more or less the overview that the global burden of disease gives to calculate part of, of, uh, of the, the, their uh, disability adjusted life here. And you can see that it involves many steps and many choices that have to be made. But also a lot of data is needed. You need to understand maybe the quality of the data and also you have a lot of results. People were indicating that they wanted to have more detailed results. Uh, we have very often uh, the results by sex, age, disease, risk factor, maybe by year, and also for different countries. So the, 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 the results can be rather detailed. And it's also good to understand what is actually really relevant for the, uh, for the users. That's not the only thing. The first thing, of course, if you look at the push model that is being applied rather often, is when. When do you want to have your uh, results being uh, brought forward in the policy cycle? Uh, and then you have to think of the different aspects of policy cycles. I won't go in detail in this. This is something that we are dealing with within our working group as well. How, when to deal, uh, when to uh, produce or bring in the and the results in the process of policy making. The second point is, of course, who? Who should you be targeting? What kind of interaction with, uh, with whom? With what kind of policy makers should you strive for? And the third point is the what? That you have, therefore, the data information knowledge and wisdom pyramid that you can use quite a lot. Uh, researchers in general focus much more on data information, while policy makers want to have much more the knowledge and wisdom actually layers being addressed. Um, so you can overload easily policymakers with all kinds of uh, uh, results, very detailed, but very often they want to have very, uh, let's say, simplified results that what, what can easily be translated into policy messages. And of course, the how, what kind of products do we want? Do we want data, dashboards, infographics are very uh, popular these days, but also policy briefs are important there. Not only the push model is of relevance for the, doing a BOD study, something that we are focusing on is different phases of doing a, a burden of disease study. So you have, you start with the scoping and then of course the selection of diseases and risk factors is important. And that requires also that you have much more interaction with other stakeholders uh, in the field uh, doing it. That's also regarding data collection and processing and methodological choices. So you might have to include many stakeholders that are experts on data. What kind of quality of, what is the quality of the data that you're using? What data sources are actually available? Uh, so that's the doing part. The, the producing phase, that is a bit what I showed with the, for the push model, then it's important. Then it's the products that you want to be used by potential users. And the, th and the fourth phase, phase is the monitoring phase and that one is very often a, a bit neglected that we also evaluate what kind of uh, results are actually actually being used so that's focusing a lot on the users and how it's being used for example in presentations or other aspects these kind of things are being addressed within our working group on knowledge, knowledge translation and we try to bridge it from, let's say, from theory to practice. We want to have a sound theoretical basis of the work that we are doing. 
and that's something that uh, with uh, knowledge translation is not too difficult because there are many different concepts out there, rather theoretical concepts. We want to, uh, of what we're doing, we are uh, organizing training schools to uh, have a better understanding what is necessary to have a, a good tr knowledge translation. And for example, that also includes uh, stakeholder involvement, but also what kind of products can you think about, what works and what doesn't. Uh, we want to have exchange of experience and expertise. What we saw in the Mentimeter that there are many uh, uh, countries that already have burden of disease studies that are being uh, done and uh, also being used. What is the uh, experience of using of, and uh, producing these studies? So the exchange of that experience is rather important. And of course, that might result in good practices that we can see good uh, infographics that are being done and that might also bring the opportunities that we have. But also let's not forget there are many barriers as well. When is it rather difficult to organize a BOD study or what are the difficulties in having the results proper, being properly used, for example, by policymakers. And at the end, and that's something that we want to, uh, to have as a result of this working group that we have a kind of toolkit how to do uh, good knowledge translation for burden of disease. Just to give you an idea, uh, uh, Elena Palario showed up in the, in the video already, and we are focusing, for example, on barriers and opportunities in virtual sessions for the knowledge translation working group and things that are popping up. For example, uh, it's important to think of who has the mandate to do a burden of disease study. Many, many, many co uh, concepts of BOD are rather complex and they might require a much more simplified way as well of explaining what it actually is. And that's something that we're putting uh, some effort in. Uh, also, what I could see in the word cloud before, there's a, there, you can see there's an increasing application on the regional level, but then you get might get also uh, issues like how to link the regional, national, and also the global level of burden of disease uh, initiatives. We have to account for the size of the countries. Smaller countries might have less uh, resources, and but it might be easier to organize. Bigger countries might have more, let's say, the, the subnational structures that play a role as well. And how to find resources. Yeah, that was being mentioned and that's seen as, a, as a, one of the barriers by our, our respondents as well. And of course, the, the engagement of stakeholders that was mentioned by you as well. So that is something still that we are investing a lot in. So what are the next steps then for this working group? We have, uh, we're going to have, as Brecht already uh, mentioned, an advanced training school that will uh, be a three day training school with theoretical uh, uh, aspects, but also with more practical things, exercises. And that's going to take place in May or June. Secondly, we will keep on doing what we, with what we did before, bringing together experience and insights from burden of disease studies, especially regarding knowledge translation. It's, it's actually the holy grail that we're looking for, which might not exist, but it might help that we are, are helping each other in exchanging uh, the, the, the good experience that we have, the good prax practices that are out there. And of course, it's, those are the steps uh, towards a burden of disease knowledge translation framework. I see Brecht is already back again, and this was the end of my presentation. I don't know if there are any questions. You can put them in the chat. I think we do have some time, but... Uh, Otherwise, I will give the floor back to Brecht. Thank you. Yes, ex excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Hank. Um, in the meantime, I had to pick up my kids because there's COVID in the class and they're not able to go to school anymore. Um, but now I'm back um, and happy to give the floor to our, our next speaker, um, which is Sarah, who will uh, give you some more details on the work that she has been coordinating within the COVID-19 burden task force. And I think this serves as a very nice example for how we can collaborate in small and dedicated groups, uh, task forces. So 
another gentle reminder to think of this spreadsheet that I uh, talked about before. Uh, but Sarah, please feel free to give us your update on the COVID uh, burden activities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Speaking of COVID, right? Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen directly. So let me know if you see my presentation. Uh, not yet. Right. Coming. What about now? Yeah, now it's starting to share. And it's there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you so Thank much. You. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about our efforts in the COVID-19, the burden of COVID-19 task force to help each other uh, to estimate the national burden of, of COVID. But, uh, oops, just. Um... So Brecht showed this picture already earlier today, and this is, as Brecht mentioned, the only picture that we managed to take together. This was at the, our first working group meeting um, in Copenhagen. And if you notice the date, uh, this was taken either on the 19th or the 20th of February 2020. So this was just when the whole world was starting to talk about COVID-19, this disease that was uh, showing up in, in China or in Asia at that time. Uh, but we were still uh, able to meet and, um, and have our meeting normally thinking that maybe the problem will be over soon. But in any case, we did start talking about this at the time. Uh, we also mentioned that eventually it could be interesting one day to estimate the burden of COVID-19. Of course, we had no idea of the impact that the disease would have in, in our countries and in Europe, uh, the globally also um, at that time. So the COVID-19 was declared as a pandemic soon after this. This was in the 11th of March of 2020. 20. So also at this meeting, we were, of course, having the different meetings um, of the working groups and under the infectious disease working group, we were sharing our interests and experience in the different types of infectious diseases. So I, for example, I'm particularly interested in foodborne or zoonotic diseases, and there was colleagues interested in, uh, in other diseases. None of us had experience in um, in COVID-19 specifically, of course, because this was a, a new disease um, coming up. So soon after this, we learned much more about the disease. As we all know by now, COVID-19 is, um, is caused by a coronavirus. It's now called the SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and I mentioned that it was declared as a pandemic. And we've also learned about the high uh, global impact globally. Soon after this meeting, and we started exchanging ideas about how to estimate the national burden of, of COVID-19, we also realized that this was actually the perfect, and I just mentioned this, the perfect practical example, the practical case study that would allow us to contribute to all the aims of, of our network, the European Burden of Disease Network. So if you think about research coordination um, objectives of, of Burden EU, uh, we would have the opportunity to get together and develop the disease model, identify the health outcomes of the disease, identify the data requirements and all the computational fr framework to estimate the burden of COVID-19. And even more so, uh, if we think about building capacity objectives. So at this stage, we were, I wouldn't say all of us at the same stage, but we were th definitely all of us um, in the need of taking steps. So we could use this opportunity to, to build capacity in, in the countries that are involved in the network to, to do the calculations. And the same goes for the knowledge translation steps that uh, Hank just mentioned. Uh, so a bit more of the timeline soon after the, the disease was declared as a pandemic, some of us got together to think about a, a framework, a, a protocol to estimate the burden of COVID-19. And we, we did write one. This was published on our website in October 2020, and it was also published um, as a scientific peer review paper. And then understanding that we were actually already taking a number of steps in a more unstructured way, we decided to to form the what's called now the COVID-19 task force in March 2021. 
So the burden of COVID-19 task force, this is also what you can see in, in our website has, uh, we've defined the terms of reference for our task force. We have a number of aims. As you can imagine, we want to share experiences in our national burden of COVID-19 studies, but most of all support each other in doing the calculations, defining model assumptions and, and identifying ways to overcome the data gaps. We've put a lot of efforts into harmonizing methodologies and align our strategies for communicating the results. And we've been discussing projects um, and upcoming evidence, um, particularly on long COVID, which, uh, which for which we're still, of course, gathering data. So we have um, a number of us from the network, not only from the working group on infectious diseases on the on the task force, and we meet regularly approximately every six weeks. For each meeting, we either select a different topic or, or ask each one of us to give a presentation and then start a discussion on that. We always have a planned agenda uh, to follow to guide us through these discussions. And then we've also um, make, been making use of an online forum, which is also um, and placed in our website to have a discussions where each of us can can pose a question and get uh, a, an answer quite quickly. So we progress with our studies. So we noticed that some of us um, in one of the questions that uh, put earlier and what we could do to even improve more our network. Some of us mentioned more active mentoring and country to country support. I believe this is exactly what we're doing uh, in this task force. So again, a very good example. The, the, the task force is always open. So if you're not a member of our group yet, you're very welcome to join. Um, but there's other other things we've been doing under the task force. So we've already mentioned, or I've already mentioned the protocol. Again, this is in our website. Um, and in addition to the group meetings that I mentioned that we have regularly, we've also have been having a number of ad hoc meetings with specific countries. So again, we're going back to the active mentorship. So let's say that. Uh, um, in Belgium and me in Denmark have a specific uh, question challenging with our methodology. We talk and one of us will guide, will mentor, um, or it is happens with other countries, of course, for specific national studies. We've also decided it would be useful to have separate meetings to focus on long, long COVID. This is because the epidemiological evidence is still being gathered. There's a number of our institutions that are actually having epidemiological studies um, running, and we want to share experiences on this to see how we can, we can we're able to use this information later on to be integrated in the burden of COVID. Um, and the good news is that since we've started working together, sharing experiences and supporting each other. A number of studies have been launched in our country, so national burden of COVID-19 studies. And we've all been using the same or a harmonized approach, which is of course adapted depending to the country's data or specificities of one or another population. But we're pretty sure that we're being able to to generate comparable estimates, which of course for, for burden of disease metrics is particularly important. So here we have a snapshot of uh, an, a, a quick outline of the countries within our task force. So of course there's other countries uh, globally, but these are within our task force, the countries that have already started studies. And on the, on the list of countries on the left, you see in bold the, our colleagues, the countries that um, have already es uh, published the estimates and the other ones are are very far on the line. Either papers have been submitted to scientific journals or are in the process. So this is quite exciting that we've, we're managing to, and this is in a very short period of time, as you can see, we've, we've been managing to produce so much by supporting each other. I'm also showing you an, an overview of specificities of each of these studies in terms of the data that was used and um, and the time period I, I used in each country. And then also um, a summary of the results in terms of DALIs per 100,000 and how this compare or differ to each other. Of course, the countries are quite different and the ways that uh, the pandemic has been lived or the epidemic in each country has been lived is also different. 
Um, so I'm not going to go into a discussion of how we can compare these estimates, but one thing that we've we've been uh, discussing at length and and being on one hand reassured about the methodology, but also on on, on the equality of the impact in, across populations. Um, is that the proportion of the burden of disease that is ex explained by disabilities? So by YLD, YLD is actually uh, quite similar across countries. And there's, of course, some specificities of the studies here that need to be discussed. I'm also glad to share that we're actually writing this up um, in a publication, which should be finalized quite soon. Other activities that have been run by the network in general, so Plecht has mentioned this, but of course they're quite aligned um, with the task force, so we've also been heavily involved, um, are the webinars on, on methodologies uh, to estimate the burden of COVID-19, so we've had two related webinars already, and we're continuing planning to planning new activities. So we will definitely continue supporting each other and, uh, and new countries that will want to to conduct new, uh, other studies. But I also want to expand the analysis in the different countries. For example, and these are just points that we're starting to discuss to be able to measure the effect of vaccination programs when we run the same studies in the same populations, but in a different period of time. So after the vaccination um, programs have been implemented. We also want to include include the burden of long COVID-19 in, uh, in all studies. Some of our countries have actually included preliminary estimates of long, long COVID. Others have chosen not to do that until more robust data are available. And then we continue striving for, for international comparison. We're also uh, communicating with other countries outside the region, for example, Australian colleagues from the burden of disease study are also on the task force. So we align methodologies and discuss results. And we've had contacts from other countries that have estimated the burden. And again, then they found our protocol and, and they want to be in touch with us for, for knowledge sharing and support. So, as I mentioned, the task force is open to anyone. If you're not yet a member and if you're interested in, in joining us, um, please contact us, either myself directly or using Plex or, or the, the info burden EU email. And this is a bit of what you can expect to share experiences, having support with calculations, harmonizing the methodologies and continue discussing related projects. Uh, and if you have any question, let me stop sharing my screen so I can see you again. Yeah. I think there's some uh, questions on the chat, right? Like, are you are you looking into those? Um, I am, but I think they refer to the previous presentation. Is I missing okay. something? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yes, and what is also important, of course, in the success of this task force is the, the good coordination of yourself, Sarah. So thanks a lot for all the, the time and effort and energy that you're putting into this. Um, yeah, it's really because of people like you and, and many others that we can achieve the outputs uh, that we are achieving in the network. So thanks a lot for that. Um, so that said, uh, if you would have any questions for for Sarah or on COVID-19, don't hesitate to contact us by email. We're always very responsive, so uh, don't feel afraid to uh, to contact us. Um, but I believe that these two presentations have given a very nice idea of what we can uh, achieve and set up in terms of joint research activities. Um, Typically, these research activities are the, the result of our networking and capacity building um, activities. And they can also, of course, build on past collaborations that were already in place before we started with our network. So we've seen the nice examples of um, Hank and Elena on the knowledge translation work. Uh, then the work that Sarah is leading on COVID disease burden. 
Um, and now in this final part of the session, I want to give you some additional examples of what we have been achieving in terms of outputs. And all of this is available uh, again via our website. So if you look at the outputs menu item there, you will see uh, everything that we will be presenting here. Um, and one of the main outputs, which is not really research per se, but this supporting the research that we are doing is our European Burden of Disease database. And the idea is that we capture all publications, scientific publications, also reports um, that focus on the use or interpretation of DALIs in a European uh, context. Uh, if you look at the website, and it might take some time for the website to load, but once it is loaded, you will be able to search um, using free text uh, in this uh, in this database. Uh, you will also see that the different um, records are categorized by topic. Uh, for instance, risk factors, disability weights, methods, NCDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you want to find an overview of European research, uh, European DALI estimates on a specific topic, then you can directly filter. And the same for the countries. If you want to see which studies have been conducted in your own country, you can easily filter and, and get the overview. And this supports us in many different ways. It helps us keep track of who is currently active in the domain of uh, burden of disease in Europe. It will also help us in, in networking because maybe we will find some other individuals from the same country uh, that have worked on burden of disease. So this can help to connect to, uh, to these people. And it will support capacity building because we can have a quick overview of past studies that can serve as a source of inspiration for uh, future studies. Um, so it's available via the, the website and the direct link is um, burdeneu.net slash outputs slash BOD database. If you would see any publication or report that you are aware of and that is not yet listed in the database, uh, please let us know by email and we will be very happy to add it to our database. So the idea is that this can be a continuous, uh, continuously updated um, tool. Okay, but the main focus is, of course, on conducting research ourselves uh, through the different ways of collaborating and, and capacity building. And in that respect, I'm extremely happy and proud to be able to show this overview, which is not even a complete overview, but is uh, an overview that fitted on my screen that shows uh, the initial outputs in terms of scientific publications of our network. And you see that these cover a variety of topics, uh, figuring a, a variety of, of individuals who have been involved. Um, and I'm yeah, very happy to see that our efforts and activities within the network are indeed able to result in uh, quite a number of scientific outputs. And of course, many more are to come. Um, I want to give a specific uh, highlight to uh, one of our more recent joint papers, um, uh, one of the systematic literature reviews that uh, dealt with uh, NCD uh, burden studies. Uh, and this is very efficiently and kindly led by Pericles uh, with the support from many others. Uh, but I want to show this and highlight this because this is one of our first real collaborative outputs. Collaborative in the sense that we did our best to give everyone from within the network the opportunity to uh, contribute and collaborate, uh, which resulted in a, a larger author list and also a group author for everyone that um, collaborated and contributed to uh, some part of the of the work. Um, there will be many more of these papers to uh, be released soon, uh, but this will be covered by Juanita in, uh, in the upcoming presentation. But I just wanted to highlight this because it's a real proof that we are able to work together, that we are able to generate joint outputs. Uh, and also, once again, to explicitly thank uh, Pericles and all the others, mainly young uh, people who are very active, very energetic, and are very efficient in taking the lead in, uh, in these activities. 
Um, but that said, I want to give the, the floor to Juanita to give you a more detailed uh, summary of what has been done with these uh, systematic literature reviews and also an update on the publications based on the GBD uh, study estimates. Uh, and afterwards, we will give the floor to Elena von der Lippe uh, to give you some uh, information on the DALI calculation checklist that we have been developing. So, Juanita, thanks a lot and feel free to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brecht. I hope you can hear me. I'm we can computer. hear you, but we don't yet see the presentation. No, I'm going to share okay. it now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, Not yet. Yes, I hope I'm sharing it now. Yes, okay. Perfect. Yes, well, thank you so much, Brecht, and thank you very much for the opportunity to quickly talk about the systematic literature reviews uh, and also the global burden of disease studies that we um, did in Europe, or not the global burden of disease studies, but studies with data from the global burden of disease study. So first of all, um, as Brecht probably already explained today, um, the Burden EU research objective, one of those is to compare and harmonize methods and approaches for burden of disease assessments. And for this purpose, we performed several systematic literature reviews. Uh, we performed four in total. And the aims are actually very much similar, uh, namely how many burden of disease assessments have been performed across Europe and in which European countries have they been performed, which data sources have been used as input data for these burden of disease studies, and also which methodological approaches have been used to measure mortality, morbidity because of causes of illness or risk factors. Risk factors. So these are the sort of common uh, aims and objectives of the systematic literature reviews. Sorry to interrupt you, Anita. We don't yet see the full screen. So we still see the, the PowerPoint app with the, the menu items. Oh, really? I don't know if you have different multiple screens or... No, I have... Uh, let's see. Or maybe just put it on presenter view then. Can you see it now? Uh, no, it's still the PowerPoint okay. program. And uh, you had this sort of trick to go with the sort of control something? Um, yeah, but not sure if this, maybe if you can reshare. So stop sharing yeah. and then share again the yeah. window with the full screen version. I stop sharing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm going to share again. Still the same? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, you can just click on the full screen down at to the right. Here, maybe this. Do you mean no, this? No, um, I think it's what you did. Eh? So, the the symbol just next to the minus sign. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that one. This one. Are you now seeing the whole presentation? But yeah, and no, not. Oh, okay. Uh, Maybe I'll just present it like this. Yeah. Okay. And then make sure that you move the slides here and not. Yeah. The, sorry. The, so. The <laughs> so. Yeah. But it's okay. We can. <laughs> yeah. So thank, thank you for interrupting, uh, Brecht, and uh, and for your advice, Peter. I'm sorry. I'm at the computer at my work where I'm never. So now I'm just. Klungen. Yes. So the aims of the systematic literature reviews are actually just to uh, see like which burden of disease studies have been performed, uh, which data sources have been used, and also which methodological approaches have been used, because there's a wide variety of options. And in order to compare and harmonize, we first need to know what the state of art is at the moment. Uh, so there were four systematic literature reviews, uh, one on non-communicable diseases, one on injuries, one on communicable diseases, and one on risk factors, which is on the next slide, as you see here at the left. <laughs> um, more than 8,000 records have been screened, so um, I really have to give a big applause to Periklis, Yadalampus, uh, Vanessa, Gorasso, um, Joanna Margado, Elena Palari, and uh, Lea Sletek Jacobsen for screening these more than 8,000 records. And in total, for the non communicable diseases, uh, 163 studies were included. 
for the injury burden of disease studies, 125 were included. For the communicable diseases, 184 were included. And systematic and the risk factors I will come at uh, in the next slide. Um, and then for the burden of disease studies, you have two types. The one type is burden of disease of multiple causes. So you have a burden of disease study on communicable, non-communicable injuries, for instance. And you also have specific burden of disease studies. So only focusing on injuries, for instance, or infectious diseases. Uh, and here you also can see some statistics of these studies. Uh, for instance, how many countries have they been performed in and how many national studies were performed or how many multi-country studies have been performed. Everything has been recorded, including the data sources that were used and also the methods that were used. And here you see some results from the uh, systematic review on risk factor burden of disease studies. And uh, in this case, more than 100 studies have been included of which uh, 54 were single country studies and the others multi-country. Uh, so a lot of work has been done. Um, the systematic review on non-communicable diseases has been published as just shown by uh, Brecht. The systematic review on uh, injuries has been submitted and the systematic review on infectious disease and risk factors are still ongoing, but already um, I think halfway. So with all the four systematic reviews, we, we are more than halfway and I'm very happy with all, all this work that has been uh, performed. If you want to look up the burden of disease uh, of the systematic review on non-communicable diseases, you can find it in the, uh, the database that Brecht just showed or download it. It's open access, so everybody uh, is able to download this paper. I can put uh, the link to the paper in the chat uh, later on. So thank you to uh, particularly the persons who screened all these more than 8,000 uh, papers, but I also want to thank more than 100 Burden EU cost action collaborators who all participated in these uh, systematic review, one or more systematic reviews, and also provided feedback on the, on the manuscripts that were um, shared. So this is the part on the systematic reviews. Um, I will now go through to the other part of the papers that we have been publishing on. Um, and these are the GBD papers uh, that are also started by members of the Burden EU and several members of the Burden EU network have uh, provided or helped with these uh, uh, studies. So with these burden of disease uh, papers, so these global burden of disease uh, study papers, well, firstly, it's important to know that from the global burden of disease study, you can download the data from the GBD tools. So everybody is able to download the input data, so the epidemiological data, not the case by case data, but you can find which input sources were used, but you can also download the results, like for instance, the incidence, prevalence estimates, uh, DALI estimates. And this provides the opportunity to write papers on GBD findings in, for instance, special interest areas. So for instance, cancers or injuries, but also for special interest regions, so this particular country or a particular region like the EU, for instance. And during the Burden EU meeting in Copenhagen in 2020, which also has been mentioned a couple of times, several people have expressed their interest to be involved in one or more of these GBD papers or a specific topic or interest uh, topic or interest region. And these people grouped together and then the next step was to write a sort of scope of the paper, the aims, uh, and also choosing who is going to lead this paper because uh, a paper like this does benefit from uh, somebody who leads it. Um, so several ideas were uh, posted and also several of these ideas then uh, transformed into actual manuscripts. And here are some, some ex examples of those uh, GBD linked papers, we will call them, um, for instance, the State of Health in Europe, which is led by João Vasco Santos. Uh, there was also an Aging in Europe paper, um, which was led by Kim Muscard Iberg. Uh, Burden of Disease in Serbia, which is really a special interest region, uh, which is led by uh, Malena Santri Milena Santric. Health inequalities in Europe, led by José Penalvo and Injury in Europe, which was uh, led by myself. And several of these papers have now been submitted to a journal or are now waiting on feedback from GBD collaborators. And um, I think the last thing I can say about these papers is that two routes have been taken. 
either sending a, a GBD proposal or a proposal for a GBD paper to the GBD or to IHME, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, to say that we are going to write this paper. Uh, and the other route is to just write the paper and then um, see who is interested to be involved from IHME or not. Uh, and both routes have been successful to a certain extent. So you can take two routes here. So this is an overview of uh, some of the GBD link papers that have been performed. And hopefully in the next year, uh, several other papers will follow. So hopefully some people will be very enthusiastic now and think, I also am going to write a DBD link paper with some of the Burden EU network members. If you have questions about this uh, process uh, or how, for instance, we went on with our injury euro paper, you can always contact me. Um, my uh, email address is on the Burden EU website. Uh, thank you very much. I will now share, stop sharing. And thank you very much, Brecht, for giving me the opportunity to uh, present this. Yeah, perfect. And thank you for taking the lead in and the coordination role in uh, many of these activities. So thanks a lot, uh, Juanita, for this. Um, we will follow up with a presentation on the DALI calculation checklist, um, which uh, will be presented by Elena. And this activity fits very well with um, the activity on the systematic literature review. Uh, so it basically builds on those activities, um, but Elena will yeah, discuss this in, uh, in more detail. So Elena, please feel free to take the floor. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Brecht. Um, I, will, I will talk only very short about uh, the, um, the next output that we are aiming at uh, um, from our cost action. And um, um, this is the um, developing, uh, development of a checklist we had um, as an deliverable already planned this long time ago that uh, one part of um, the outputs of our cost action uh, will cover the development of a checklist uh, for burden of disease studies using the disability adjusted life year metric. And um, uh, based on our knowledge gathered on the systematic uh, literature reviews where um, different criteria were developed for, for the um, papers uh, dealing with um, DALIs. Um, and uh, of course, the knowledge that we have gathered from the training schools, from the feedback of uh, all the participants, uh, all these ideas that we have um, gathered and developed, we will put into a checklist. Uh, um, the, the aim of uh, the aim and the scope of uh, such a checklist is um, to increase the consistency and transparency in reporting on DALI reports, and we aim at improved comparability of DALI estimates and. Um, we want to develop a kind of um, checklist that focuses uh, mainly on the quality of the DALI reportings in a descriptive manner. And we have uh, discussed uh, different options how we can structure such a checklist. Um, at the moment, we have the idea to um, uh, have uh, different uh, structures like in a normal paper, usually there are the settings of a study, the data that is used, the quality and the manipulation of data, the, the uh, daily methods that are used and uh, uncertainties, etc. And um, we will provide um, um, detailed explanation for each of these sections and the checklist items and we will have a checklist um, provided for um, with a reference to the pages in each manuscript. So um, we hope that um, such checklist uh, will be helpful for all the upcoming um, reports on um, DALI estimates uh, for the different countries. Um, we are now um, in the time schedule, we are still on a preparatory stage, um, but we hope that we speed up the process and uh, that we soon uh, will come up um, at least uh, with a draft of uh, such a checklist. I think that's all for now.
Uh, Brecht, I have missed something. So. Uh, no, that was very complete. Thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, people interested in contributing to this work, don't hesitate to uh, to reach out to us. Okay. So I think this is indeed a very nice snapshot of the activities that we do have been doing and, and are able to do. And I hope this also gives you some inspiration to launch your own initiatives, because what is important to, to realize is that our network is a bottom up network. And the idea is not as in a, a research project that we uh, do everything, we tell you what to do. No, the idea is that we make a number of tools available and that you um, as network members make use of these tools. So please feel uh, feel encouraged to uh, take use of all the tools that we are able to offer and use them to your advantage. Um, with this, we're coming at, at the end of this session, a bit uh, sooner than foreseen, but I think that's not a problem. Um, I want to, yeah, again, remind you of uh, the different, um, the different things that we have to offer you and that, uh, are important for you to uh, to take advantage of. Uh, first, I also want to remind you of the, the request to register as a working group member. Uh, you will find the link at multiple places on our website, uh, but this will help uh, guarantee the, the financial support that we receive uh, for our network. Uh, we've also talked about the training schools uh, with the current option to register for the COVID-19 training school in Slovenia. Uh, there will be more uh, training schools um, organized later this year and, and next year. So please keep an eye on that. We will use your inputs and feedback to uh, define the contents of our future training schools. Uh, the mobility grants, as explained by Tina, uh, with now the virtual mobility grants, which are extremely flexible and powerful to help support you. Um, and also note that we will continue our webinar series um, to uh, connect to the international burden of disease atmosphere. Um, and again, I've mentioned this already, but it's important to stress, uh, please make sure to use the network to your own advantage. It's a bottom-up network where you are able to uh, take initiative to start new things. Um, and this is also what we want to support now in, in a more proactive way through our spreadsheet um, for new task forces. Uh, and I've seen that this um, yeah, has already attracted quite some, uh, some attention. Um, if I can uh, share it with you, we can have a look together. Uh, so we see that um, for the possible task force on uh, on PFAS, uh, Leah Jacobsen would be interested in taking the lead and, and coordinating the discussions. Um, for the other proposed task forces, I see a lot of members interested in social inequalities and, and air pollution, for instance, but it's also very important to have uh, a person coordinating uh, these task forces. And I can assume that it's, uh, you, you might have some questions on what this role of coordinator entails. Um, so don't hesitate to send an email to me or to uh, Sarah, for instance, who has this experience. Um, in the end, it comes down to making sure that you can keep the, the task force alive, that you can keep uh, organizing meetings to connect people. Uh, but the organization of these meetings can then become uh, the subject of a virtual mobility grant. So we are also able to uh, to reward or thank you for these efforts in terms um, of a financial compensation. Um, this spreadsheet will uh, also be shown tomorrow. Uh, please make sure to, uh, to add your name if you're interested. And if you're interested in coordinating one of these task forces, either put your name directly or, or let us know uh, so that we can answer any possible questions that you might have. Okay. Um, I want to close uh, today's session by having a look at what will happen tomorrow. 
Um, and tomorrow our uh, working group meeting will be dedicated to uh, presentations from our network members. Um, they, these presentations will cover a variety of topics. Some, as you see, will focus on, on COVID, uh, also on cancer. Uh, Pericles will present the results of the NCD uh, review, um, systematic literature reviews. We will have some more methodological pieces on, on mortality and ill-defined deaths in Serbia. Uh, and we will close with presentations on uh, air pollution in India and environmental burden of disease related to traffic noise in, uh, in Germany. Um, there will also be a poster session to conclude tomorrow's uh, module where the different poster uh, presentations will be uh, summarized in a, in a few minutes, two, three minutes, in a pitch presentation uh, presented by the respective authors. So tomorrow will be very interesting because we will be able to learn uh, about the activities of, of our members and also to what extent these activities have uh, benefited from uh, networking and collaboration within our action. So I'm very much looking forward to seeing you all again tomorrow, same time, same place. Uh, and as for now, I want to thank you for being here, for contributing to uh, the interactive elements. Uh, the slides are already available via our website. Uh, the recording will also become available. And then, yeah, thanks once again. And I wish you all a very nice afternoon, evening, and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you very much.